loading. Please wait. Greetings, I am Baron Munchausen, and you are my granddaughter. Yes, my granddaughter, sweetheart. So, ladies and gentlemen, where did we draw up? <laughs> yes, yes, Silent my voice is back. Return <laughs> to the fireplace. <laughs> Sit down, guests. Let's start. Oh, that Munchausen. Part one. The most truthful person on the planet. My little old grandfather with a long nose is sitting near the fireplace and telling about his adventures. His listeners laugh right in his face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this Munchausen. What a baron. But he's not even looking at them. He calmly continues about how he flew to the moon, how he lived among three-legged people, how he was swallowed by a gigantic fish, and how his head got torn from his body. Once, some passerby listened to all of this and suddenly could not stand it anymore. It's all lies. Nothing like that ever happened. What are you talking about? Those counts, barons, princes and sultans, whom I had the honour of calling my friends, have always said that I am the most truthful person on the planet. Everybody laughed even harder. <laughs> and Munchausen, without so much as flinching an eye, continued on how a deer grew a magnificent tree on its head. A tree? On a deer's head? Yes. A cherry tree, and it had berries on it so juicy, so sweet. One gentleman moved closer with curiosity. Could you give a little more detail, Baron? I haven't heard this story yet. Yes, Munchausen, and tell us about the polar bears. And about the Spaniards? And about Gibraltar? And about the hare! OK, OK, you talked me into it, although it's not all that difficult to do. Ladies and gentlemen, what time is it? Oh, we have plenty of time, so, ladies and gentlemen, take the tables, bring the chairs, just make yourselves comfortable, because all these stories I will now tell you myself. Here, by the fireplace, and next to me, I have my lovely granddaughter. <laughs> You see, my memory is not at its best right now, but I will tell you what I can remember, and my lovely granddaughter will help me. Right, sweetheart? Of course! Oh, thank you, my darling. So, 
Listen to my story and tell me whether the world has ever seen a person more truthful than Baron Munchausen. A Horse on a Steeple I set off from Rome on a journey to Russia in the midst of winter, from a just notion that frost and snow must of course mend the roads which every traveller had described as uncommonly bad through the northern parts of Germany, Poland, Courland, and Lavinia. I went on horseback as the most convenient manner of travelling. I was but lightly clothed, and of this I felt the inconvenience the more I advanced to the northeast. What must not a poor old man have suffered in that severe weather and climate, whom I saw on a bleak common in Poland, lying on the road, helpless, shivering, and hardly having wherewithal to cover his nakedness? I pitied the poor soul, though I felt the severity of the air myself. I threw my mantle over him, and immediately I heard a voice from the heavens, blessing me for that piece of charity, saying, You will be rewarded, my son, for this in time. Uh, well, I went on. Night and darkness overtook me. No village was to be seen. The country was covered with snow, and I was unacquainted with the road. Tired, I alighted and fastened my horse to something like a pointed stump of a tree, which appeared above the snow. For the sake of safety, I placed my pistols under my arm, and I laid down on the snow where I slept so soundly that I did not open my eyes till full daylight. It's not easy to conceive my astonishment to find myself in the midst of a village, lying in a churchyard. Nor was my horse to be seen. What happened? Where am I? How could these houses grow here in one night, I thought? And where did my horse go? For a long time I did not understand what happened. Suddenly I heard a familiar neigh. <laughs> that is my horse neighing. But where is it? Neighing was coming from somewhere above me. On looking upwards, I beheld him hanging by his bridle to the weathercock of the steeple. Matters were now very plain to me. The village had been covered with snow overnight. A sudden change in the weather had taken place. I had sunk down to the churchyard whilst asleep gently and in the same proportion as the snow had melted away. And what in the dark I had taken to be a stump of a little tree appearing above the snow, to which I had tied my horse, proved to have been the cross or weathercock of the steeple. Climbed up? So, I started climbing up the steeple. I easily jumped on the wall and climbed the bricks because Munchausen is an excellent climber. But when I was climbing, it was already twelve o'clock. So, a bell rang at the top. Here is where I could not hold on any more because the walls of the church went in resonance with the bell. My hand slipped and I fell down. Fud! I found myself on the ground under the same steeple, but my poor horse was still hanging there, tied to a cross with a thin bridle. And then I came up with another thing. Hmm, but what? Called a head warden. I ran to call the city warden. I ran through the streets yelling, Mayor! Mayor! and hundreds of faces seeing me started fussing around looking for their mare. And finally, they brought an old man. He approached me, and seeing the problem, he said, Oh, a horse, I see. Mm -hmm. Since the horse is attached to the steeple, and the steeple belongs to the city, therefore the horse belongs to the city. So it's our property, and we take it for ourselves. Then I rolled up my sleeves and I went to punch the sly old mare for such audacity. 
but he let out a whistle, and the people started attacking me with pitchforks, so I dashed away as fast as I could. But the mayor blocked my way. I jumped over him and ran away from there, leaving my horse, my gallant horse, behind. Really? But what about the half a horse adventure? You didn't find another horse after this. Yes, there was such an adventure, and darn it, it was the same horse. How did I get it back then? Shut in the Prido! Without long consideration, I took one of my pistols, shot the bridle in two, brought the horse, and proceeded on my journey. Sparks from Eyes I shall not tire you, gentlemen, with the politics, art, science, and history of the magnificent nation of Russia, nor trouble you with the various intrigues and pleasant adventures I had in the politest circles of that country, where the lady of the house always receives the visitor with a dram and a salute. I shall confine myself rather to the greater and nobler objects of your attention. Horses and dogs. Ha, 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 My favourites and the brute creation. Also to foxes, wolves, bears and game in general, with which Russia abounds more than any other part of the world. And to such sports, manly exercises and feats of gallantry and activity as show the gentleman better than musty Greek or Latin or all the perfume, finery, and capers of French wits or petit maître. It was some time before I could obtain a commission in the army, and for several months I was perfectly liberty to sport away my time and money in the most gentlemanlike manner. And I'm going to tell you about different hunting adventures that I find most peculiar and amusing. As you can easily imagine, my dear listeners, I felt wonderful among my good friends who appreciated the wide, unfenced forest for hunting. Even now, remembering the diversity that is natural for such activities, as well as the exceptional luck that accompanied my every venture, brings me a special kind of pleasure. You may easily imagine how I spent much of my time out of town with such gallant fellows as knew how to make the most of open forest country. Ah, the very recollection of those amusements gives me fresh spirits and creates a warm wish for a repetition of them. One morning, I saw through the windows of my bedroom that a large pond not far off was covered with wild ducks. In an instant, I took my gun from the corner, ran downstairs and out of the house in such a hurry that I imprudently struck my face against the doorpost. Fire flew out of my eyes, but it did not prevent my intention. I soon came within shot when, levelling my piece, I observed, to my sorrow, that even the flint had sprung from the cock by the violence of the shock I had just received. There was no time to be lost. Take out the lighter. I pulled out a lighter. A lighter! Up to two times more fire. Oh, I'm so slick. Well done. And I took this fire maker, lit it. Oh, does not work. And all the ducks flew away, and I threw this lighter as far as I could. But wait, no. I remember it as if it were yesterday. It's not the way it went. Not at all. Come on, try to remember what I did do. Run home for the flint, of course. Oh, well, daughter, if you say so. I decided to run home for the flint, although in my opinion it would not be very appropriate at this moment. I ran home and... I began to search through all my belongings for some flint. Wardrobe after wardrobe, all my trousers, a utility room after the attic, but I could not find it anywhere. But in a hurry, running down the stairs, I imprudently struck my face against the doorpost. 
fire flew out of my eyes, that it did not prevent my intention. And I sat through the kitchen and asked my neighbour, but my flint seemed not to leave any trace. So I returned to my pond, where the ducks were still swimming, without paying attention to me, like they did not notice me. Oh, I should have come up with something else. Pinch yourself with a fist <laughs> in the right eye. I presently remembered the effect of hitting my face on the door earlier had on my eyes. Therefore, I opened the pan, leveled my piece against the wild fowls, and hit my fist against one of my eyes. The hearty blow drew sparks again. The shot went off, and I killed fifty brace of ducks, twenty widgeons, and three teals. The Amazing Hunt Although I've had sillier things happen to me, one morning, as I equipped myself for the chase, I noticed that the cord on which my powder horn hung was very thin and almost worn through in two places. As I slung it on, I thought to myself, That won't last long. Towards evening, as I was returning home, I passed a little lake on which about a dozen ducks were swimming. It was only possible to have a shot at one, and yet I fain would have secured the whole dozen, for I had invited a party of gentlemen to dine with me the next day. I felt for my powder horn, but it was gone, and I concluded that the cord must have snapped as I forced my way through a plantation of young firs. I had only one round of shot in my gun, and no more powder. Besides, what would be the good of a single duckling to me? Carefully dived into the lake and swam up to docks underwater. Oh, yes. I seemed to carefully approach the bank of the lake and in absolute silence, without making a single splash, got completely under the water and walked towards the victims like that. But regrettable failure! The bottom of the pond turned out to be pretty muddy to see something under the water. Therefore, I slowly moved on by touch, looking for the feet of my victims, until I accidentally came out to the opposite shore, wondering how could I go so far under water? But the ducks had not disappeared anywhere, and so it was necessary to do something else. Started quacking. For a long time I was thinking what to do, until I had a sudden inspiration. I sneaked closer to the reeds and began talking to them. Quack, 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 quack. But whether because of my British accent or because of duck deafness, but the stupid ducks wouldn't listen to me and did not even pay attention. What else was there to try? Made a fishing rod with a piece of tasty bacon. In this perplexity, I bethought me of a piece of bacon left over from the provisions I'd taken with me. And untwisting a dog leash to four times its original length and tying one end around a morsel of the bacon, I hid myself in the rushes and threw out my bait. To my delight, the nearest duck swam up and eagerly swallowed the dainty. But the bacon appeared too slippery for her and quickly passed through the duck and came out just behind it. Thus. The duck was on my line. Duck after duck swallowed fat and was similarly threaded on my fishing line, like beads on a string. It did not take ten minutes until all the ducks were strung on it. You can imagine how funny it was for me to look at such rich prey. I had only to pull the caught ducks and carry them home to my cook in the kitchen. Just as I was reflecting, that I really could not carry such a weight any further, the birds, who had recovered from their first fright, flapped their wings and rose into the air, dragging me with them.
Someone else would be lost in this situation, but I am a brave and resourceful man. Anyway, I made a steering wheel out of my coat and flying the ducks quickly flew home. But how could I get down?'